I started playing the flute when I was six. It was a very shiny instrument and that captivated me as a young child. My name is Casey Yao and I'm the Presser Scholar for the Fred Fox School of Music. Despite the hardships of the COVID-19 situation, the flute studio is incredibly lucky to have our master class and technique class in Centennial Hall. Here at the Fred Fox School of Music, we are very, very fortunate to be in an institution that is really a juggernaut in biosciences. The University of Arizona is, quite frankly, the world leader in re-entry to higher education. We get tested at least once per week, sometimes even twice, and that really allows us to still be able to play in person whilst being safe. The test, trace, treat program really allows us to return to live, in-person instruction, really without missing a beat. The Fred Fox School of Music has given me so many resources to grow as a flutist. The flute studio has always utilized a number of facets and features that we have very specialized to our campus. We have a world-class recording studio. In addition, we also have a kinesiology lab that allows us to measure and understand human capital performance at a very granular level. I'm Melissa Requist. I'm a senior double majoring in biomedical engineering and flute performance. Something really unique that I get to do here is to combine those two majors and do research on playing related pain and injury in musicians. So what I'm doing right now is looking at biomechanics of flute playing, so how the body moves when you're playing a flute and how that relates to different types of pain and injury that flute players face. The incorporation of kinesiology, motor redundancy trainings has really allowed me and my students the ability to hone their craft to an unbelievably fine point. My hope is musicians could come into a lab like this, get an evaluation of their own biomechanics, whether it's flute or any other instrument, and get some recommendations for stuff they can do to help avoid pain and injury in the future. As a performer, and now performer teacher, taking and finding the raw musical talent and helping my students coalesce that into a performing acumen is really what brings me the greatest amount of pleasure. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Brian Luce. I want to welcome you to the University of Arizona. I'm actually in Rehearsal Hall 232. Um, as you watched in that video, there's a lot that we're able to do on this campus which is not normal in many other places and it has to do with our biosciences, it has to do with our College of Medicine and many things like that. So first of all, I want to welcome Casey Yao, whom you met uh, on the video, so to speak, who's from Hong Kong, and Ivo Shin, who is my doctoral teaching assistant. He is from Natal, Brazil, uh, award-winning performer in his own right, just won the Mid-Atlantic Flute Competition, actually won the last competitions before COVID struck, um, as well as the uh, Arizona Flute Society Young Arts Competition, our uh, for President's Competition here on campus. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about the real basics of preparing yourself for collegiate study. If you think that you are bitten by the bug to be a flute player, to do what we do, I want to go through the what will really be how we organize things as flute players. And what really becomes important for us is that we place ourselves in the mindset of an athlete because you are you are all musical athletes and in so doing there's so many things that we have to do on a daily basis before you can jump in and start playing anything where you're jumping around and, and moving all over the flute from register to register it's gonna take a little bit of getting the muscles ready. And plus, if you approach it this way, you're gonna get much more effective practice. And that's, that's the goal for us, is not to practice more, but to practice more effectively and save yourself time. So the first thing we wanna go into is what we do as flute players in order to allow us to sound clearly and easily. The first thing is gonna come about from what we do in any kind of athletic activity, and that's stretching. We're going to be stretching muscles, and in particular, and there's always a quiz for this class, in particular the mouth, uh, the muscle that goes around the mouth. 
and that is called the orbicularosaurus. That muscle is the most important one for us flute players because it's what we use in order to manipulate the airstream as it goes into our piece of plumbing. So from that standpoint, we're going to also strengthen that muscle as well as a number of other muscles in order to make ourselves play better. From strengthening, we're then going to work on agility, how to make the fingers work, make them work accurately, fast, quickly, and efficiently for us in order to play whatever you need. Fluidity, how do you make the sound sing? What allows the flute to work really well? The flute is not a very loud instrument. Matter of fact, it's not like a violin where it resonates in the tube. It's just a hunk of metal that doesn't ring a lot. So we're going to do certain things in our practice that allow our sound to sing as much as possible. Finesse. What can you do in order to allow yourself to move smoothly from one note to the next in any given piece of music that you have? And then, of course, how logical do we move our fingers? Because as we know, our goal as flute players is to take all of the 43 possible notes on average that we can play on this flute in any register, in any range, and make them work smoothly to any other of the 43 notes in any register or any range. One thing I want to say is I want, if you have any questions, you want to put them in the chat, you want to um, raise your hand at all points and during the uh, clinic here, I want you to be feel free to do so because it's really important that we have some interactivity while we go through this. So first of all, stretching. What do we do? So your brass playing brethren do all sorts of lip slurs all the time and we're going to do exactly the same thing. In playing this, the simplest thing is to start with the tuning note, which is an A for us, very common note. We're looking for a very clean, very clear, easily executed octave. That might seem like it's mundane, but there are so many ways in which it can go wrong for us. We can mistakenly where the top octave is not in tune. And actually in this room, if I do play a flat octave, it creates sort of a, 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 a cognitive dissonance in the sound. It's like two waves fighting each other. But if I, if I use the embouchure in the right way, it lasts longer. As a matter of fact, if you can ever steal away in a large space, you're going to be able to hear so much more about what your sound does. And for us here at the U of A, as you saw in the video, we're able to be in Centennial Hall, which is just about a five minute walk from here that way. And it allows us to really know what it's like to play on the performance stage. So after COVID, I don't know, we're going to have to go back to my studio. And I don't know if Casey and Evo think that's going to be a great thing. It'll be nice to be in person, not uh, having to be at least 30 feet from each other as we play, but there are some byproducts of it. So what I would like you to understand is, as you see there on the, on the screen, that very famous equation that is Boyle's Law. That's from chemistry. Many of you are either in chemistry or are going to have chemistry or have already had it. And in this case, your chemistry exam right here, the pressure multiplied by volume is that amount of air. Forget about the NRT stuff that's on the other side. That's you. <sighs> But everything else is how we manipulate pressure and volume. And this is where your warm up comes in. This is where that orbicularosaurus is going to work. So as we move upward and we push our corners forward, if you use just the embouchure, I'm not doing anything to the air except just blowing faster and faster and faster, like I would do in any phrase, whether it's loud, soft, staccato, legato. All I'm going to do is just simply push the corners of the lip forward in order to create the octave and then the octave plus fifth. We're listening really importantly for intonation more than anything else. Not really listening for tone color or tone quality yet. That's going to come later. But you'll notice there's one really, really important relationship there. You see that there's some ratios there. The one thing I know about it, when I double the air pressure to go up an octave, it's going to half the volume. And if I do this correctly, the higher I go on the flute, the lower note will be the loudest. That's a really important thing to know. A lot of people have this misconception that the flute is always soft in the low register. It is soft when it's paired with another instrument. Yes, that's true, because if we're playing with the same note with an oboe, the oboe is going to win. It's got much more complicated harmonics. But for the ratios and relationships for us, it is really, really easy to practice and play just by pushing the corners forward. So to go up, push your corners forward. If I'm going to the octave plus fifth, the only thing I might have to add to that is to drop my jaw. If you want to improve your tone color and sound, Drop your jaw, open your teeth. My teacher always said, if you take your thumb, 
put it on its side like this and put it between your molars, that's the space to play in the upper register. If your teeth are clenched, you're always going to get a and it'll be out of focus and it won't be in a nice, really clear color for people to hear. So in this stretching and strengthening for our first athletic pursuit as players, we're going to simply push our corners forward to go up. And so on and so forth. You can see in the exercise, all we're doing um, is playing from that A, working our way up and then back down. We realize that like the flute, like a brass instrument, when we start, the top note we'll ever play is the C sharp. When we play that C sharp, that's the top note. We can't go any higher on that. It really doesn't help us to go any more than that. You can see in this one, this exercise, if you, you can play it from the top note if you like, you can play it from the middle note, from the bottom note, whatever you feel comfortable doing. But just remember, if you start on the top, it should be louder on the bottom. If it's not louder on the bottom, you're not burning some calories. And that's what that orbicularisaurus muscle is doing. Its whole job is to train that. And if you work these simple harmonics, there's not that many of them, work your way basically down from the C sharp all the way down to the bottom of the foot joint. And if you want to have a better low register sound, it's going to come by playing these harmonics. Stretching and strengthening. First thing you do, just like if you're out there on the ball field and you're trying to actually stretch muscles. So after we stretch and strengthen, then the next thing we have to do is put together some agility. So many of you have been in some kind of athletic pursuit before and you have to do your ladders. You're out there on the field doing wind sprints, you're doing suicide runs, you're doing stadiums, all those sorts of things. That's what we're doing here. Scales are really that for us. And the one thing I want everyone to keep in mind is when you play any given note, the biggest problem with flute players, with tone color, is that you're leaking on the flute. Now let me explain what that is. If I play a standard F major scale, not a really great sound to that scale. But if I change one aspect of the way I play, I can have much better control on it. Now, in slow motion, what does this look like? And that's what this crazy looking little exercise is here. But in slow motion, if you'll notice, I finger the note that I'm about to play before I articulate it. That's one of the most critical things you can ever do. Saxophone players, clarinet players, oboe players, they all do exactly the same thing. But if you can seal your plumbing before you turn on the faucet, it'll be so much easier for you to have a great sound. We've all played long tones. We like that. It makes us sound good. We work on developing that sound. But now we have to actually make it work in agility. And I do this first and foremost because me, I have to be very honest, I don't like long tones. They make me bored and I tend to zone out and I'll play flatter and flatter and flatter. And I find that not only here in Arizona, but in Texas and Pennsylvania and Arkansas and New York and everywhere I've been around the world, everyone gets bored by long tones. So I'd much rather jump into scales first and do my ladders because again, athletic pursuit. So if I'm practicing this, this is what you're going to do. You can use it with any regular articulation. You can use just the air. You can use the reverse double tongue syllable, the coo, if you like. There's many ways you can do this to help plan this. But the problem is, and there, I'm going to give you the catch-22 about flute development, because in all rehearsals, we spend about 75% of our time doing nothing because we're in a rehearsal situation. About 30% of the time is when we get to play. It's just very normal in any rehearsal. So me, like you, have spent many years going <laughs> blowing air through the flute. The only problem is, is if I spend 70% of my time in rehearsal, and maybe I don't get a chance to practice that night, if I don't do anything else, I have actually <laughs> coordinated my fingers with the tongue. If I make my fingers close at the instant my tongue happens, then I'm always going to get a 
I don't get that clear sound, but if I move my fingers before, so the secret to having a good sound all the time is being there on time. Have your fingers at the ready before you ever blow into the flute. And it just takes coordination. Once you get used to it, then you'll have the control of the notes as you play from one to the next. So that's really, really critical. It's just like doing your ladders on the field or running your stadiums, having those. And on every scale that you play, every scale that you play. So I like scales, play majors, play minors, play arpeggios, lots of things we can do with that. Once you've built in this agility, and this is part of your daily practice, then the next thing we're gonna go on into is gonna be the fluidity of sound. The fluidity of sound is what allows our sound to sing beyond. As I mentioned, the problem is that when we play as flute players, it's a very small sound. I know I'm in this room by myself and I feel pretty good. It sounds really, really good by itself. But if I get into an ensemble where there's maybe seven more people, then I'm fighting to be heard. So what allows us to be heard? There's several different things, but one of the most important things is learning how to make the tongue work quickly. So this is where I want everyone to practice and memorize this saying. It is simply two, 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 coo, 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 coo. Now, me, like many of you, probably saw the double tongue syllable written out as T U C U, which I grew up in the I grew up on the ranch, so we tend to say ta ka. The only thing with that is it makes my tongue flatten out in the back of my throat, and nothing moves really well. So, if I make myself say two coo, it's actually going to curl my tongue a little bit, get it out of the way, and it's going to make it move really, really fast. So after I've played my scales, then I'm going to get my tongue working really, really quickly because I know I have to play a lot of rapid articulations and all kinds of music. So in this sense, I'll just play that lip slur. And that's why it's got the low G there. We're going to play that harmonic, which is a D above the staff. And then we'll blow. Two, 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 coo, 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 One, two, three. And with that, that's my basic sets of repetitions. And as you can see, I'm going to move my way up the flute from that G to G sharp, and I'll go all the way to the C sharp. Now, this is where it's a little bit of a test. Sometimes we get caught. Because the one thing, and we're going to talk about this later, about finger logic, but one thing that's really important is to learn what are the best fingerings for not only harmonics, but to make the flute work well. There is one problem. If you use the one-in-one -one B flat fingering for that B flat, when you play, it's going to jump the octave because it's simply not going to allow that. There's something called an anti-node that happens down here in the sound and it shoots out that top B flat. So therefore, we'll use the chromatic fingering for B flat, which is this little lever right here, or you could use the thumb if you like. You'll have to move it off when you go to the B. Work your way up. Now, of course, the whole goal is to eventually get faster, have really rapid tongue motion so that you could play. so that you have a really fast, rapid, light tongue because we're gonna need it in so many of the things that we play. But never practice double tonguing in the low register. Always practice it up high. You have to realize that your brass playing friends, whenever they play double tonguing, they always play it in that register. They never actually play in what's called the pedal register. This G actually for us is the pedal register of the flutes, the lowest register. So we always want to play it where it's actually going to be in the third partial. So that's what that's called right there when we play that. After you've worked on fluidity, then now it's about the singability of the sound. We've got the singability of the notes so that when I play those scales, double tongue, now I have to be able to play the notes so that they don't sound bland. Because if I play them, that's nice, it's fast, it's quick. The only thing it doesn't necessarily have that singability, and that is gonna come from vibrato. Vibrato, of course, is the change of pitch. It goes sharp, flat, sharp, flat, sharp, flat, just slightly above the pitch that you're playing. 
Now, how does this work? It actually happens with a set of muscles called the cricoartenoid muscles. <laughs> That's a fancy, great little word. And if you know anything about the way we work here at the U of A, it's all about muscles. We work on which muscles we're going to train. So they're muscles that sit inside your, vo your voice box. We actually discovered this through some fluorographic studies back in the 1970s. So we've known how vibrato works. Now it comes down to the training. And this is a really simple method that you can use because it's still based upon what we do for double tuning. All you're going to do is take that same lip slur and then practice what we call around here the prissy cough. So if your um, grandmother or your aunt or someone like that goes to a fancy dinner party where they eat finger sandwiches and they drink tea and they pick up their pinky, whenever they clear their throat, they'll go eh, like that with their little doily. Eh. So that's all we're going to do here is practice that slight cough in succession. So eh, 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 eh. it's really important that you take the tip of your tongue, put it on your bottom teeth, eh, 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 and this is going to allow that sound to these muscles to practice opening and closing, opening and closing. Because once we have this, then the flute's going to sing. For example, if I play one of the Allstate etudes, that's nice, it's got the notes. The only thing is it's missing something really important. So this is where my finesse practice comes in. So all I'm gonna do is I do this in 12-8 time, and the pulses you see there are really, really important. Don't do any more, don't do any less. So we practice one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly, one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, and then we'll breathe on the end of that last note. So it's gonna sound like this. We're gonna go G to G sharp. It sounds one lolly, two lolly, three lolly. And that little, it sounds like I'm tonguing, but I'm going I am gonna take that, and in this exercise, this is, especially when I'm on the road and I'm a little jet lag, I might just grab this simple exercise, warm up those cricoartenoid muscles. And as I get faster, something magic happens. vibrato is ready to go so that when I do play I now have something that's going to allow the flute to sing and vibrato is so critical to our sound the absence of vibrato the flute is not going to project very well vibrato is what really allows the flute to sound versus any other instrument that we play so now, what I want to do is we're going to talk about what we do with organization of the fingers next. So in working, we've, got, we've worked on our, our basic, simple stretching and strengthening of the orbicularis oris. We've got some agility exercises with moving the fingers before we close, uh, before we articulate. We've now worked on the finesse of the tongue and we have the singability, the fluidity of the sound. Now it's time for being smart with our fingers. Most all of you use your thumb B flat key. Without that key, I think I would probably not be a flute player because there's too many times when it would be almost impossible to play. There would be no way to play that Carmen Fantasy well by smacking your one and one B flat key down. I would say that I use this key probably, I'd say 80% of the time as a flute player. I'll use the lever B flat, that's this one right here. If you push on it by, it's a little lonesome. You'll see it closes the B flat. Matter of fact, if you just touch your B flat key, the one we skipped, you'll see it wiggling there. I'll use that one probably, I would say another, we'll call it 14% of the time. And then 1% of the time, I'll actually have to use that one in one. My students around here, for those who are not familiar with using especially the lever key, after they practice with it for one month, they never want to touch their one in one B flat key again. They find it very awkward to do. So it's really, really important when it comes to learning our fingers. So the law of the B flats, that's what I call it, finger logic. So thumb B flat, I think, especially in our band world where most of our B flat and E flat instruments don't necessarily play music that's in that sharp side so much, we're gonna use thumb B flat. You can use it on every key on the flat side, including D flat major, 
We can't do it on G flat, but we can do it on D flat major. And only if we get up to the top G flat is it problematic. But as I play, and I just put my thumb, not a problem. It just sits there the whole time. So that will save you a lot. And I tell my students, save that quarter of a calorie motion of doing your index finger up and down and put that into vibrato so that you get some singability out of it. But that's going to come in really, really importantly, especially when it comes to many of our etudes. I'm going to ask actually Evo to play a little bit of the uh, first all region etude, the all state etude for you, just to kind of hear it and what we do in it. And, and when we get to the end here, oh, of course, we're going to open this up for any Q&A you might have about not only the flute playing, but if you have things about the music. I know a lot of people are always interested in the all state etudes. Go ahead, Evo. That was beautiful. Evo, could you imagine playing that without thumb B-flat? Probably not. Not, ha not happening. <laughs> you get a hernia trying to do that without it. It just uh, definitely wouldn't be as clean. If I did one on I'm going to have to pop these fingers up and down, but otherwise... It just is so easy. You just park your finger over there. There's only one in one of the diminished sevenths where you have to take that finger off. It's in the, th the fourth measure of the second line for that diminished seventh arpeggio, but really nothing else beyond that. The lever B-flat. As I said, this is the B-flat fingering that is equivalent to the side B-flat or the chromatic B-flat on a saxophone or a clarinet or even an oboe. The only thing is that we do it backwards. <laughs> Ours is a much simpler mechanism. We don't have nearly the doodads and gizmos that all those other instruments have on it. And that's why they expect us to play things really, really fast. But on the B flat key here, when I play the B flat, either descending or the A sharp ascending, we call it around here the bad house guest key. By that, if you're going to ascend through a note, as you can see where I've written that bracket right there, I'm gonna put that lever A sharp ascending I'm going to put it down while I'm playing the G sharp, the A flat. It's not doing nothing, but just sitting there. And then when I get to the A natural, all I'm going to do is pick this up. The one great thing about that for all of us is if you've used one and one B flat over the years, you don't get a finger glitch. It's impossible, and I love that about playing. The thumb B flat, I can't miss the B flat. And this one, I cannot have a finger glitch. And in my way of pl uh, playing and practicing, the way I was trained, the way I train the students around here, is that we avoid the injuries <laughs> before we get to them. So if you just simply put that down on the way up, it's like a bad house guest that arrives early before the, the dinner party starts. And then on the way down, it stays late. I just take it off long about A flat or G. I just take my time about it. But that will save you so much grief over the years. It's going to be really, really important. Matter of fact, where it really comes in handy for us in many cases is going to be in places where we have keys that incorporate A sharp. So in this case, Right there on that. All I did is I popped my finger down on that. And it was ready to go. Really, really easy. I didn't have any finger glitches happening in there. And then at the very end, if I'm playing at the coda, The only time I had to use one and one, which I don't like to do, but I had to do, is at the very, very last A sharp, because I have a D sharp coming afterward. So I'm not saying never use this one. We actually call it an anchor fingering. It's used to anchor. And as you can see in the last one, one and one B flat, is really good. 
when you have to play that or where you have a, another note around it where you're going to have that A sharp there. Very, very important. Now, the other thing that you can see there is talking about anchoring, anchor fingerings. The great thing about the flute, just like all sorts of other instruments, and you might have heard your friends on saxophone talk about this because they tend to do it a lot, is that when we play certain pieces of music, certain passages, I can keep fingers down. They don't even have to wiggle at all. Which, as we all know, if I play a long tone and I hold this flute steady, it sounds like a million bucks. But if the flute wiggles around on me, I'm not going to have the control. But if I can hold on to the flute, it makes things clear. So in this case, you see a G flat arpeggio. If you notice, I didn't even move this finger at all. I could actually put this down here just because. It doesn't matter at all what happens with that finger. Or the next one, which is the diminished seventh arpeggio. You'll notice that that finger never moved at all. So I would be always looking for places where you can be lazy with your fingerings, but accurate. Now, I don't do it in a place where it's going to distort the pitch. That's really, really important. Matter of fact, if I go back to that number five A to, I could play and keep that there the entire time. You see that I've got my lever for that. That makes it smoother because I definitely don't want to go because Nine times out of ten, even though you might use a sloppy fingering, what it does is it makes you sacrifice musicianship. Most of the time, if you have a sloppy fingering, you're probably going to play louder so it's cleaner. You're going to give up vibrato. You're going to give up dynamic control, contrast, all those sorts of things. So that's where I say be smart about your fingers so that you can do all the other stuff that you want, the things that make your musical performance effective. Make it beautiful as we play along. And same thing, at the very end of the piece, when I finish at the end of the second nine, you can see I didn't even move my finger at all. It just sat there the whole time. And then when I play the next bar, it's still going to be there. And it just sits there. Anytime I play in the key of G flat or B major, I'm going to probably keep this finger down all the time as I play. Really, really important, especially for some of you who might have come from other instruments where you're used to using the middle finger for F sharp. This will get you out of that habit where that middle finger F sharp plays a slightly flat F sharp. Now, this is where the fun begins, as I say as a flute player, because now not uh, we don't really consider these to be finger tricks in a way, but now it's going to be time to go into what the flute is capable of doing, especially the French model flute, if you have one. So when the next order of business as we go to in our daily practice with those anchor fingerings is going to be intonation and resonance fingerings. Now, what does that mean? Sometimes when we play a note, we want that note to be really, really strong or we want it to be really, really full so that we can play it clearly. So one thing, as you notice, and you probably know this before, people talk, call this all the time fork F. If you're playing a top F that's sitting in a chord in the last note of a piece in, in a piece of music, whether it's in band or orchestra, you might be playing away, but it might be too sharp. And the easiest thing to do is simply add the third finger down. And it'll drop at about four cents. It gives you a little bit extra leeway as you go along. Same thing with high G sharp. When you play a high G sharp, if I add those fingerings right there, it's going to make that A flat work better. Or for those of you who have maybe played the Stars and Stripes, when you play it on a piccolo, it does not want to play that high A flat. So that's why those of you who might have played piccolo before and learned of that fingering, when you play high A flat, that that you see right there, that minus 11 cents is going to give you exactly that same effect. It's going to allow the piccolo to work really well. So those are really straightforward ones. Same thing with D flats. People tend to take D flat. I don't advocate putting down the index figure because it makes the note really stuffy. It makes your vibrato really hissy. What I like to do is I add two, three, and put my finger on the low D flat key. And it significantly lowers it, but it keeps the tone color nice and full. 
Now, this is where the fun begins because a lot of people get caught in playing music where you might not have the best control, especially when it comes to softs and things like that. So the thing that I love to do as a flute player is take people's breath away. That's what we, we want to do. When we're performing musicians, people are paying ticket prices so that they can have this emotional moment. And for me, it always comes down to the softs. You can command an audience and you can make them not even breathe for five seconds while you're sustaining a note. And if you happen to be playing something that involves a very easy note to play, Now, I did a number of things on that, but the important thing is this French model flute. The reason why many of you have them, or if you don't have them, this is the reason why you would want to get one. The reason the holes are there are not to torture you. They're not meant to keep your fingers in the right place. That's what I was told when I was in high school, but that's not that at all. It's not to ensure good hand position. The whole point of the holes is so you can leak off of them. That's the point. If I play a diminuendo on an F, it wants to go flat as a pancake. But if I take my index finger and slide it up the tube, it has to go this way. You can't go backwards or forward. It has to go up the tube. And the audience doesn't breathe until you take the flute down. That's a great moment. <laughs> So what we want to do when we play that, and as you can see on this list, it's called venting. Anything that has one of these five tone holes that allows it to vent are going to allow the flute to work really, really well. So a low E flat. If I get closer to the camera. An E. F. Especially a G sharp. A G sort of, it can help a little bit, but you have to be careful because it'll want to go, it'll lift up on you. Definitely an A. Anything that is based on that, so you see that list of harmonics there, those are the notes that will vent. They can vent very well and you can play those really softs. If you're playing the, playing the old cantabile presto, but before you play that second movement, there's a really, really super soft high D. Now you probably see two things are happening. First of all, I'm holding onto that lever. It helps me hold that flute nice and strong. But the other thing is that I'm venting off of that tone hole, that one right there. It's leaking just a little bit, and it can go softly, and it doesn't go flat. I like that. Because if I go flat by two cents, the whole audience goes, oh, that's too bad. And the funny thing is that your friends who play clarinet, they can go sharp by seven cents and no one ever knows. It's the problem of how we perceive sound as human beings. So we really want to focus on those sorts of elements. So now I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet, but this is the time. If you have any questions you want to ask, you have a captive flute player. Actually, you have three captive flute players for the uh, next 12 minutes to ask whatever you would like about the flute. This is your time. Or as my, uh, one of my teachers would say, I'll sell you a fingering. And we'll talk about the, the third octave sort of fingerings as we go along as well. But um, since we don't have any questions just yet, the one thing I want to kind of go into is talk just a little bit about piccolo. And I, I know Casey has her piccolo today. Um, I want to talk just a little bit in terms of what the piccolo if you haven't played it yet, the sorts of things that you can do to make the piccolo work a little better. First of all, you have to be very strong in your embouchure. Your embouchure has to have a great deal of strength in order for it to work. So the same thing applies. Casey, why don't you play a couple lip slurs on us? Uh, Casey, what I would like you to do is I want to show there's a really fantastic trick that piccolo players use all the time on the piccolo. We can use it on the flute too, but it really works great on the piccolo and no one ever knows. It might sound weird to you as a piccolo player, but it works. One thing for we as flute players, we call this second trill key around here, we call this the Swiss Army knife. 
key because this one does a zillion things for us. I mean, a lot of different things. It can get you out of a jam. And the great thing about it is that in that second etude, it really helps to a great extent. You want to play that for us, Casey? Just the opening of it, maybe a couple, first two bars. So on that particular start, we know that the piccolo is kind of cranky. <laughs> it doesn't want to play very well. But the great thing about it is if you start by putting your finger down on that, that uh, second trill key, when you start on a piccolo, Now there's things, the piccolo unfortunately doesn't have open holes. I've always wished that the piccolo would have open holes because it would give me even a little bit more leeway. Um, but just by starting on that, that makes that E just speak really clearly. You can do the same thing for the flute or the piccolo. Just put down that trill key and it'll just, you can whisper at the, at the flute or the piccolo and it'll speak. So anytime you have to have really, really super soft, that's a, that's a very, very important thing in order to make it work as we play along. Um. Argenis, excuse me if I'm saying your name wrong, um, says for region A2 number two, you recommend the two, three, and right hand, since there are so many C sharps. Thank you. Actually, what I would do, and I'm sorry I don't have Piccolo with me, is I would anchor the entire time. If you look at actually this finger and this finger, they never move. That's what I would do on that occasion. I don't do it all the time, but... The funny thing okay. right there is I play thumb A sharp because I want that to be perfect. There's yeah, no way I would ever reach over and play one and one. That's gonna get me in trouble. So that, that question was uh, meant for the flute etude, number two. I would play... If you look, as I played, similar to what, I, what happens on the piccolo one, I start with this fingering. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to this flute a lot. Yes, I definitely would. That, that's, that's something I didn't mention in, in the uh, Flute Player's Playbook, but we do it a lot. We will sit on this key, the third one and that one, to help anchor the flute. If I've learned anything over the years, the more I hold the flute well, the better sound I can get. People always say they hate C sharp, it doesn't sound well. I say do this. Grab your flute and go. And you'll probably play a beautiful C sharp. The problem with C sharp is we're going, oh my gosh, I can't barely hold the flute. So it's a hand position sort of thing. Another question? Yes, um, someone says, could you please show again which fingering would make the high F less sharp? In uh, the third octave, anytime I need to drop the F to bring it down, I'm gonna add that third finger. I'm just gonna simply put it down. If I'm playing fortissimo, as loudest as I possibly can play, and I don't want to even think or sweat a, a one drop of sweat, then I'm going to be sharp. And if I have an open hole flute, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to play the F and I'm going to hit this ring. I'm going to close the second ring. And I can really power through that note right there. It's a really strong one, but it works very, very well for us. Is there another question? Yes, um, Bethany asked that. She says she was actually taught first learning to use the thumb B flat for the B flat fingering. And as a result, she rarely uses the right index for that note. Will that be an issue? Also, can you please show the lever B flat close to the camera? So um, for instance, in that um, B major, the number five, when I play the lever is this key right here. I'm sorry, mine has a, I have a C-sharp trill key, so you see two of them right here, but on everyone's flute, there's a little key right there. It is literally called the A-sharp trill key. That's what it's called. There are, there are three trill keys on the flute. There are the two normal ones we consider. I know we call this um, trill key number one, trill key number two. And, and a little aside on trill key use, always touch this trill key with this finger and this trill key with this finger. Never reach over here. Remember when you play top B flat, you've got your finger like that, and when you play top B, it's like that. 
If you're used to reaching over, you're gonna miss out on some really fantastic things you can do with the trill key. So we call it again, finger logic. These three fingers here, these three fingers here. You can just take your flute and slide them up just like that, but that's the A-sharp lever. So when I play right there, um, That's how I would use that lever. And then one more question. What note do you think is best to tune on the flute? Well, the first, the note that they actually make the flute tune to is the A. Uh, it is the universal note for every instrument. As a matter of fact, they measure every tone hole and everything versus, the, it's, it's not actually the A key, but it's that tone hole right there. It is the tone hole, if I balance the flute, it balances right there in the middle of the flute. Um, so that's the universal tuning note. Um, when I taught in Texas high schools, they always tuned um, the brass and the woodwinds to A. And I know it is easier to tune a B-flat instrument to B-flat because that's sort of considered its home note. But I do know by, especially Yamaha, um, they build their instruments around the A. Uh, whether And most of them are tuned to 442 so that you can play 440 or 444 depending on where you travel around the world. And I played in foreign countries and, you know, I, it's weird because I'm used to 440, but I might have to spend a month tuning with my flute higher just to get my ear used to it because it feels weird to me. But um, no, I, it's the A. The A is the easiest and whenever I'm tuning it, I'll always play a lip slur just to be sure that I'm actually tuning. Some people can tune poorly just by what they do incorrectly. We have five phrases that we say around the flute studio all the time. The first one is, roll out. So if anything is wrong, anything goes wrong on the stage, or you think the note's about to go away on you, we just go, roll the flute out. <laughs> and most of the time, especially if you have bad intonation, if you just, if it's in tune on the tuner, but it doesn't blend well, probably you're too rolled in. That, that lip slur I just played was not in tune. It was flat on the top. So if I go, then it's perfectly in tune. It's just the same thing if you're a brass playing friends, have too much of the mouthpiece on, um, on the uh, um, bottom lip. That it's just not gonna work as well. So that's two thirds, one third for us, rolling it out. We just want 50% of the air to go in the flute and 50% out. Someone asked, what would you recommend to be able to tongue fast? To tongue faster? Well, many different things, but what I believe in really doing when you have to tongue fast, is to practice all of your agility exercises, those scales. I practice them first by developing strength in the embouchure. When the embouchure is strong, your tongue's gonna work. But if you have a weak embouchure, nothing else works. It's just a real simple athletic thing. If you don't have a strong arm as a ball player, you are not gonna be successful in playing ball. You have to have that strength that's there. And the orbicularosaurus strength is really, really important. Casey, you might even wanna put that in the chat and tell, spell that word out so everyone knows exactly what orbicularosaurus is, but that muscle around your mouth. So when I practice scales, I can play. That's me and my lips just doing it, nothing but the lips. And by that refinement and that strengthening, then as I tongue, and the faster I go, so, and the, the other thing about speeding up and slowing down, if I were to recommend one exercise to being able to tongue fast, but to play fast, is it's probably one of the bread and butter sort of Bibles of flute technique, and that's the Taffanel and Gobert book. If you know it, um, it's really, really critical, and, and I would definitely type that in so they know what Taffanel and Gobert is. Um, because the exercises number one and number two, I grew up doing them <laughs> a long time ago, <laughs> a few administrations ago. That, what I did at 13 years old, playing that, because my teacher said, you memorize that by next week. So she made me memorize in one week all my Taffanel and Gobert. Um, I, I thank Miss Nichols for making me do that because that led to the, the speed. And I encourage all of you, you are in the right age, the perfect age to develop speed right now. So I would definitely use that. And then you can tongue it, of course. Someone asked, do you have any tips on tone? On higher notes, I sound kind of breathy. Is it just based on your breathing or are there um, always alternate fingerings? It's 
So the important thing about high notes, I'm going to change the camera here just for a second because I want you to see what's happening. This is something that not everyone knows, and I'm going to give you a secret that we use here at the, at the flute studio. We've often heard the saying that you play up to the low notes and down to the high notes. Or I, I was taught, well, when it's difficult to play high notes, just think of your playing low notes, and then when you're playing a low note, just think of playing a high notes. And if you know anything about the music man, the think system never works well. <laughs> um, so what we do in our flute studio, in order to play high, you need all of your body muscles to work together. Again, we're a total athletic complex as a flute player. So if I am gonna play a high note and I wanna develop better sound, when I play those lip slurs, I literally squat. In the Paris Conservatoire, they said, when you play high, you squat, you go low. When you play low, you go high. So when we start playing low notes, we go, and the low notes pop right out. So the one thing, if, when you're watching YouTube and you're seeing someone's performance, see what they're doing with their feet. Because you would be really surprised that when someone might be playing, they will never go, because it'll crack. Or when they play high, they'll never go because it's going to be out of control. But you're going to develop the strength. So you need all of these muscles and all of your body to like try to bust your lips apart. And only through that will your lips develop strength. Good flute playing is a battle between your lips and your embouchure being really strong so that all this air is going like and your lips are saying, no, no, no. Through that strength, both of them being strong together, you'll develop a good sound. So, but lip slurs are where it's at. Your brass playing friends are exactly right. Long tones, no, they actually do not develop leg strength. Someone asks for a flute etude number one. one. What, are what are some, some ways? ways? <laughs> what are some ways to make um, the etude have more emotion? Well, in terms of emotion, this one, um, I think the way you play the prowlers, and that's the actual proper name for those little, those little trills on top of it. What makes them really sound sprightly and fun and emotional is going to be vibrato. <laughs> My students around here all know if there's a question, if, if we say, well, something needs to be better, nine times out of 10, the answer is more vibrato. <laughs> When I go to Korea, it's Hong Zung Vibrato all the time. So if I play that more, uh, or it's not a more, excuse me, that prowler, I'm not going to go because there's no vibrato. But if I play vibrato, then I'm going to have something emotional that's happening with it. It's really important that you always play with vibrato. If I was going to say anything to make your music emotional, is going to be have vibrato in your sound. So that vibrato exercise, it's not the most enjoyable one to do. It is hard work. And you have to have a metronome. You have to be totally even. You cannot let it get out of control. But that's going to give you the ability to play. If I don't play vibrato, you get this. There's, it almost sounds like a machine is doing it. So vibrato is probably going to be the most important element. And then we have a question from Ramos. He says, what is the best way to play piccolo after only playing flute for eight years? For marine band auditions, you have to audition on both. Any practice material suggestions? When playing piccolo, actually, my uh, one summer before I was playing a big international competition, she said, bring your piccolo and you're going to start warming up every day on scales on piccolo. So the secret, I think, to playing scales, and this is where your, your, either your flute teacher, your band director, uh, for me it was my band director probably first, he, he always said, you know, play your scales backwards, forwards, upside down. So I think on piccolo, the thing is, again, you have to have a lot of strength here. I mean, I, the, the one thing that's unusual about maybe how I describe things in my flute studio, but it is literally what they describe it in the Paris Conservatoire, um, is that you have to be strong. So I would play my scales instead of playing I would play them so I'd start on the top that making yourself play up in that register is really important and remember you're playing in such a high range that making the piccolo work is going to demand that your teeth are really wide apart if you're biting with your teeth you will never be able to make the piccolo 
You're going to buzz or you're going to get all sorts of things like that that happen. And yes, there's going to be a lot of screechy high notes in those Marine Band auditions. I remember doing one of those many, many years ago, 1992, I think, if I remember right. <laughs> None of you were around back then. Jalen and Chloe ask, how do you really project low notes? Well, it's what I said before. If I'm really going to project something low, so I use this example all the time. This is a piece that, uh, that I play on the road quite a bit. It's just the Paganese 24th Caprice. It's the... And it has a lot of spots. The man for, who wrote it or who transcribed it for flute wanted to showcase how low he could play. So it does things like... So you can see, I don't know if you can see from my lips, my lips are going 90 to nothing. High note, low note, high note, low note, high note, low note. But that's a lot of sets and reps of doing lip slurs. I mean, a lot of them. But then the other thing that really helps is, again, what I said about the lower body. If you watch our flute studio, which actually we're going to start broadcasting our techniques classes every Friday at 11 a.m. So if you ever want to pop in on the YouTube channel, I'll make sure that, it, that you can find it on uh, all of our social media. Um, but what we do when we warm up, if I need to play low, all I have to do is stand up. Matter of fact, we have a move. One of my students, we call it the Hallie move. Because Hallie will, all she does when she plays a low note, she goes. Matter of fact, you can do that at home. Just pick up your foot, your left foot. And it'll honk right out. It's just knowing your body and how it works. That might seem crazy to do, but I can tell you, once you start analyzing professional players and what we do on the platform, you will see a lot happening with the feet and you'll think, well, we're being really musical. We're being athletic. If you think about it in terms of foot placement and athleticism, you'll see that. Um, if you go back and watch that video uh, that we showed before the class started, it's online in many places, you'll see a lot of those little things happening that happen here all the time. But it is, it is 300 years old. People have been doing that forever. It's just, when it came to America, we tried to make flute playing like clarinet playing, like trumpet playing, but it's just not the same. Someone asks, how do I avoid become distracted or bored during warm-ups? It is so easy to just focus on the music and ignore the basics. So I had this discussion, um, was it last week or the week before? It was the week before because we had midterms. We were around here when we play midterms, we all play scales by memory techniques in front of each other. So it's, uh, I grew up in Texas, so <laughs> when we did all state tryouts and all region, it was in front of everyone in a big room. So you just stared them down and you learned to develop a cast iron gut. But to avoid boredom, what I do, literally this playbook, if I spend maybe one and a half minutes playing, I don't know if you notice, but I'm going up and down. That's me moving in the registers. But I do that, and then I go to... I go to the scales, then I go... I'll do literally this playbook, and I'm really not that bored. The one thing I have to say, because I get bored playing long tones. I, I hate long tones. I really do. I'll be just honest and come out and say it. I do not like long tones. I will do things that help me with long tones, but I don't ever focus on a long tone with by itself. It's going to be part of vibrato. So for me uh, and my students, I tell them that like a good athlete, you should spend two thirds of your time. Two thirds of your time should be on technique and skill. One third should be on repertoire. That might seem crazy, but any of you who have been in any athletic pursuit, you are going to spend a lot more time training than you ever will be playing that game. And our last question is, do you have any tips on playing with braces? You know, I never had braces myself. Um, my son had braces. My daughter will soon have braces. So um, I, I, have to, I have to definitely plead ignorance on this. I've known a lot about them in terms of what people have done. The problem with braces is that literally, as you can see now, is I'm going like this all the time. 
it's going to be dragging across uh, those, uh, across the braces, definitely across the, the bridges and the bands and all that sort of thing. So um, many people will start off with um, putting wax on them so that it moves a little smoother. Um, most of the students that I've had with braces have just developed a lot of scar tissue. I'm sorry to say, I mean, it's a suffering for your art in many, many ways. That's, um, it's a tricky one, uh, I have to say, because it's gonna take a little bit more time and development of that, because you got a lot of resistance with the, with the braces in there. I wish there was a better answer. If you ever wanna go to someone who probably really has the best answer, her name is Kathy Johnson. She's probably one of the best band directors in the state of Texas. She actually now is in charge of woodwind instruction at the University of North Texas. But drop her a line because she really is the best with it. And I would always give due deference where, it, where it's due. So, but Kathy's spectacular with that. One more question. Anna Sophia asks, how about when playing high notes? I tend to take breaths in between and sometimes I can't play them at all. Okay, so uh, your sounds like you're running out of gas in the upper register. What is probably happening is as you're playing a high note, the embouchure is too big because the one thing about playing the flute is it's easier to play longer higher than it is lower. I can play a lot longer. I'm not even a third done. But once I get in the low note, there's not that much left. So it, it, what I would recommend again is in the very beginning, development of strength in your embouchure. Um, because the high notes should have a very small aperture. I mean, a very, very small aperture. And if we actually, if you look behind me, this was Evo, who was my TA before you can see on the board there, I was just teaching woodwind methods. This is how to teach band directors how to teach the flute from the beginning. This is the registers of the instrument. And you can see there's the math right there. There's Boyle's law, the relationships and ratios and all that stuff. So it's about strengthening in it. Your brass playing friends understand that too. Um, there's a little bit more involved with it, and I don't want to go into it here, but really, if you just play lip slurs, um, it, first of all, it avoids boredom. It really makes your embouchure work because long tones do nothing for your muscles. They're static. They don't, they don't do anything. So I don't know about you. I mean, I'd, even if I was ready to throw a ball and I was doing this, this isn't doing anything for me. I'm just frozen in time. But if I'm actually taking that and moving, then I'm going to have a lot more effort and get a lot more um, out of that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. I, I, if you have any questions ever, drop us a line. Just contact me, brian at brianloose.com, or you can use my university email address, our social media. Um, Casey, uh, you'll find both Casey and Evo on social media. Any of my students, many of them are on there. They'd be happy to speak with you, give you the nitty gritty sometimes about the flute studio, what happens here, the ways of playing flute. So we're always happy to work with everyone. So. Welcome to Band Day. I'm so glad you're here. If you ever want to chat with me or anyone, please, just anytime, anytime. We're always willing to help. So enjoy the rest of Band Day. Take care.